Hello everyone, my name is Betty. I'm a 62-year-old lady whose life took a turn about six years ago when my husband passed away. Despite this, I've continued to work and find joy in my large family, consisting of four children. Three of my kids have moved to various parts of the country, starting families of their own, leaving just my son Stephen in our hometown. Stephen met his wife, Jessica, during his time at the local community college. I've always liked Jessica and believed that as long as Stephen was content, that was what truly mattered. Their union was swift, followed by further academic pursuits and eventually successful careers. They decided it was time to expand their family and welcomed my grandchild, which filled me with excitement at the thought of spoiling another grandkid. However, Jessica seemed hesitant about me spending time with my grandchild, Carl, setting strict boundaries on our visits. This arrangement puzzled me, especially as it persisted even when Carl turned seven. Nonetheless, I respected their family dynamics. Over 10 years, my opportunities to bond with Carl were limited, but it was clear we both shared a love for reading. I cherished the moments I could gift him books, hoping to bridge the gap between us. One unexpected day at work, Carl called me, which was unusual since we rarely communicated outside family events. My attempts to connect with him had always been met with distance, making this call all the more surprising. Grandma, can you talk? He asked. Of course, my dear, what's going on? Are you okay? I responded, concerned by the evident distress in his voice. He revealed he was at home with his parents, but insisted on needing my help specifically. Puzzled and a bit caught off guard by his request for rescue, I assured him I was serious about helping, despite my initial reaction of disbelief. His plea for help was sincere, and I realized this was a moment where I could finally connect with him on a deeper level. Despite the oddity of the situation, I think I found a different approach. Sorry for laughing before. Now, can you explain a bit more about what you're experiencing? You mentioned needing to be saved from your devil mother. What exactly do you mean by that? I asked, trying to understand and reassure him. Carl hesitated, whispering, She's not the kind, sweet person everyone thinks she is. When we're alone, she's mean to me. Oh no, I hear someone coming. I have to hang up. Please don't tell them I called you. And with that, he ended the call. I was left in a whirlwind of confusion and concern. Jessica had always seemed like one of the kindest people I knew. It was hard to imagine her being described as a devil. Initially, I doubted Carl's words, thinking perhaps this was his way of acting out, especially if he had been punished for something he did. Both Jessica and Stephen had mentioned Carl could be quite the handful. But deep down, a persistent worry gnawed at me. This call was out of character for Carl, and it wasn't like him to say such things lightly. Over the next few days, I couldn't shake off the unease that settled in my stomach. The thought that Carl might not have been joking haunted me. In a move that felt both necessary and invasive, I decided to purchase a hidden camera. The decision weighed heavily on me. Spying on my son and his family was not something I took lightly. However, Carl's plea for help couldn't be ignored. I reasoned that if there was nothing amiss, I could simply remove the camera and forget the whole thing. But if there was truth to his words, I needed to know so I could help. Once the camera arrived, I installed it discreetly. This model allowed me to view live and recorded footage through an app on my phone, which was incredibly convenient. With the camera in place and the setup complete, I felt a mix of anticipation and dread. It was then I decided to reach out to my son. Hello, sweetheart. How is everything? Everything's great, Mom. How about you? Stephen's voice was casual, unaware of my tumultuous thoughts. Oh, you know, the usual, but I've been thinking. It's been quite some time since we last saw each other, I ventured, hoping to visit and perhaps see for myself how things were at home. 
This indirect approach, spurred by a sudden and alarming call from my grandson, led me down a path I never expected to take. I hope beyond hope that my fears were unfounded and that a simple family visit could clear the air. I found myself contemplating a visit to Stephen's home, hoping to drop in one day casually. So, how about I come over this Sunday? Does that work for you? I ventured, trying to sound as nonchalant as possible. Of course, Mom. Sunday sounds great. Stephen's response was immediate, enthusiastic even. Yet, I couldn't help but add, You sure Jessica's okay with this? I remember how I felt when your dad would make plans without consulting me first. Stephen chuckled, Jessica will be thrilled to have you. Don't worry about it. With plans set for 6 p.m. Sunday, I felt a mixture of excitement and apprehension, excited to see my family, yet burdened by the secret task I felt compelled to undertake. As the weekend approached, I prepared early, deciding to bring a bottle of wine for the adults and a selection of books for Carl, knowing his love for reading. Arriving at their home, I was greeted with a warmth that eased some of my worries. However, noticing Carl's look of relief stirred my concerns once more. Since our phone call, there had been silence, leaving me uncertain about his feelings. The evening was filled with conversation, laughter, and a shared meal. It was comforting, familiar, yet as adult topics took over the conversation, Carl retreated to his room. Seizing the opportunity, I decided to visit him, hoping for a moment of privacy to discuss his call. Jessica seemed hesitant about my leaving, but Stephen assured her, urging me to spend time with Carl. In Carl's room, after exchanging pleasantries and handing him the books, we delved into discussions about his interests, particularly the books. He was animated, sharing his thoughts with enthusiasm. I refrained from bringing up the distressing phone call, wanting to let him lead the conversation to that topic if he felt comfortable. Our conversation shifted to his school life and other personal matters. Mid-discussion, Carl suddenly began writing in a notebook, his actions piquing my curiosity. He slid the notebook across to me, revealing a message that read, Mom's listening, can't talk about anything. The note was alarming leaving me to question whether it was a genuine concern or a product of his imagination. This visit, intended to be a simple family gathering, had transformed into a complex mix of emotions and hidden messages, reminding me of the delicate balance between respecting privacy and ensuring the safety of loved ones. Playing along with Carl's cautious approach, we carried on chatting as I sketched out my plan in the notebook. I mentioned the hidden camera I'd brought, proposing to set it up in his room to get a clearer picture of his situation. Carl's immediate agreement reflected his desperation for someone to understand his plight. After finding an inconspicuous spot that offered a comprehensive view of the room, I activated the camera and verified its functionality through my phone. I lingered a bit longer with Carl before mentioning it was time for me to leave, intentionally leaving my scarf behind as a pretext for a future visit. As I exited Carl's room, the sound of hasty footsteps retreating from the door sparked a suspicion that Carl's fears might be grounded in reality. Following my departure from their house, the evening left me drained, yet I couldn't resist checking the camera footage upon returning home. While nothing noteworthy occurred initially, my vigilance persisted, driven by a combination of concern and hope for Carl's well-being. The following days passed with routine checks on the camera, revealing nothing out of the ordinary and leading me to question Carl's allegations. However, my resolve to uncover the truth kept me watching. It wasn't until one particularly revealing evening that my worst fears were confirmed. The footage unveiled a distressing scene of Jessica confronting Carl with a stick in hand, demanding a recount of his day with unnerving intensity. Each hesitation or perceived dishonesty from Carl was met with swift, punitive strikes to his knuckles, escalating in frequency and severity. 
Stephen's passive presence only compounded the horror of the situation. Witnessing such a stark contrast to the nurturing environment I had endeavored to provide, my children left me heartbroken and appalled. The realization that my grandson was enduring such treatment under his roof was a bitter pill to swallow, compelling me to confront this harrowing reality and take decisive action to protect Carl. Believing firmly that children understand more than we often give them credit for, I was dismayed by the scene unfolding before me through the camera's lens. It baffled me how Stephen could stand by passively while his son was subjected to such harsh treatment for what seemed to be minor missteps. The urge to intervene was overwhelming, yet I hesitated, knowing that my sudden reappearance would raise suspicions. Recalling the scarf I had deliberately left behind as a potential excuse to return, I realized I couldn't use that pretext just yet. It was reserved for a future meeting with Carl. Nevertheless, I found myself reaching for the phone, dialing Stephen's number with a plan hastily forming in my mind. Hey, Mom, is everything okay? Stephen's voice came through the phone, laced with concern. No worries at all, just realized I left my scarf in Carl's room yesterday. Clumsy of me, isn't it? I was wondering if I could pop by tomorrow to pick it up. I tried to keep my voice steady, masking the turmoil inside. Stephen offered to drop it off, but I demurred, claiming exhaustion from a long day at work. After a brief back and forth about timings that wouldn't work for either of us, we agreed on a time the following afternoon when I could retrieve my scarf while Carl was home. My hastily concocted lie not only provided a legitimate reason for my visit, but also momentarily distracted Stephen and Jessica from their punitive focus on Carl. However, my relief was short-lived. Before leaving Carl's room, Jessica decreed a harsh punishment. No meals for Carl until the following meal. This declaration solidified my resolve to act. The next day, I took time off work, bracing myself for the crucial conversation with Carl. The gravity of the situation weighed heavily on me, knowing that Carl's well-being and future hung in the balance. My heart was set on offering him an escape from the distressing environment at home, prepared to do whatever it took to ensure his safety and happiness. Before heading to Stephen's home, I made sure to grab some food, anticipating that Carl would be in dire need of a meal. My heart sank when I saw him. He was visibly weakened, barely able to keep his eyes open. Jessica's harsh punishment had taken its toll. I handed him the food, and as he ate with desperate haste, my resolve to help him grew stronger. After he finished, we delved into a serious conversation. Did you manage to see what happened? I asked gently, remorseful for initially doubting his distress. Yes, and it's okay. I understand it's hard to believe without seeing it yourself, he replied. His voice low but relieved I was finally aware of the truth. Carl shared that the physical punishments were a recent escalation, but the forced starvation and manipulation had been a prolonged torment. He revealed that Stephen, too, was under Jessica's control, too frightened to oppose her. What pained me the most was learning that Carl's education was being compromised. Jessica would keep him home on days she chose not to feed him, meticulously monitoring the household's food consumption to use as a pretext for further punishment. Hearing this, I didn't hesitate to offer him a way out. Would you like to come live with me? I promise you'll be safe and you won't have to endure this any longer. Carl's agreement was immediate, a clear sign of his desperation for escape. Despite his readiness to leave, I explained that arranging his move would require some time. He bravely agreed to endure a bit longer, his resilience heartbreaking, after ensuring no evidence of the food remained to avoid worsening Carl's situation, I left their house, making a point to call Stephen to thank him for the scarf, maintaining a semblance of normalcy. Once home, I reached out to a friend experienced in family law, ready to navigate the legal complexities to ensure Carl's safety. 
This conversation was the first step in a series of actions aimed at rescuing Carl from an environment no child should ever have to endure. My friend, experienced in family law, warned me of the complexities and challenges in fighting for custody of Carl. He outlined that even if I were successful, the custody might only be temporary, allowing Jessica to amend her behavior and reclaim her rights. Given the slim evidence I possessed, a direct legal battle seemed unfeasible. However, an alternative strategy emerged in my mind, leveraging the evidence to negotiate for legal guardianship. Understanding Jessica's position as an advisor and the potential impact of her actions on her career, I saw a leverage point. Over the following days, I meticulously compiled the evidence and prepared the necessary paperwork for transferring guardianship. Choosing an unexpected moment, I visited Stephen and Jessica's home over the weekend, hoping the element of surprise would work in my favor. Stephen's astonishment at my unannounced visit was evident. His hesitance and the tension in his response hinted at underlying issues. Despite his reluctance, I pressed on, insisting on discussing an urgent matter. Stephen's defensiveness peaked when I questioned the odd timing of my visits, but my resolve to address a pressing concern was unwavering. The sound of distress from Carl's room acted as a catalyst, propelling me past Stephen and directly towards the source of the commotion. Upon entering Carl's room, the scene before me confirmed my worst fears. Carl, in tears, sought comfort in my embrace, while Jessica's hostile departure underscored the severity of the situation. At that moment, my determination to protect Carl solidified, fueled by the tangible evidence of his distress and the urgent need to provide him with a safe and nurturing environment. Observing Carl's injuries, a swelling cheek, bleeding knuckles, and welts on his arms caused by the stick, ignited an unparalleled fury within me. No child should ever endure such brutality. With a heavy heart, I fetched frozen mixed greens from the kitchen to help soothe his swelling and assured him we would leave for my place immediately, urging him to pack whatever he could. Confronting Jessica and Stephen downstairs, the tension was palpable. Jessica's anger contrasted sharply with Stephen's evident discomfort. Jessica's indignation at my intervention sparked a fierce exchange. I couldn't stand idly by while my grandson suffered. Jessica attempted to justify her actions as discipline, dismissing my concerns and advocating for a harsh parenting approach I couldn't condone. In response to their resistance, I presented them with guardianship transfer papers, explaining the stakes clearly. My revelation of a hidden camera capturing their abusive behavior left them stunned. Faced with the undeniable evidence of their actions, I made it clear, sign the papers, or face public and professional repercussions, particularly for Jessica, given her job as an advisor. Jessica's outcry against the invasion of privacy paled in comparison to the urgency of protecting Carl. The situation had escalated beyond family disputes to a matter of safety and well-being. My stance was firm. Carl's security was paramount, and I was prepared to take any necessary steps to ensure it. In response to my decisive actions, based on the distressing information I had gathered, Stephen pleaded for another chance, promising reform. However, my disappointment in him was profound. I had expected more from my son, and his complicity with Jessica's actions was unacceptable. Firm in my resolve, I declared my intention to take Carl away, stressing the necessity for the guardianship papers to be signed. The risk of the evidence I held being exposed was a deterrent strong enough to prevent any resistance from them. After leaving with Carl, I aimed to lighten his spirits with a meal and frozen dessert, offering him a nurturing environment where he could express himself freely far removed from the fear that had dominated his existence. In the ensuing weeks, the legal process concluded with me being granted Carl's guardianship. 
Jessica and Stephen's decision to relocate to another state under the pretense of not wanting to interrupt Carl's education facilitated this transition. Their move was a relief, eliminating the immediate threat to Carl's well-being. Now Carl is flourishing, his happiness a testament to the positive changes in his life. Free from the fear of encountering his parents, he's showing his true gentle nature. His gratitude towards me is a daily affirmation of our bond, and I'm committed to ensuring his safety and happiness. This journey has reinforced my belief in the power of stepping in to protect and nurture, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to offer Carl a loving, secure home. <laughs>